Thank you, everybody, for the talents you bring. Last night, I sat down at our piano. We have a little baby grand at home that I can't play, but I bought a book a while ago, like a beginner's book. And I took lessons when I was little, so I know basic notes and like where they are on the keys. So I had a song up last night, and I'm like, you know, playing the notes. But the problem is, you can play the note but without a rhythm. Doesn't sound <laughs> doesn't sound like anything. So you need the talent of of some kind of rhythm to make it sound good. Uh, so that's my problem. Rhythm, rhythmless, <laughs> rhythmless. Uh, anyway, have you ever eaten or drank something in your life uh, that was so gross you wanted to throw it up? Yes. yes. <laughs> don't look at somebody next to you if they if, if they made it. Uh, but don't hurt. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But but we probably all know the feeling of some some point. Maybe the you know have you ever had the upper GI when you had to do the barium? I'm, I'm sure we all have. Right? Uh, it's so gross, you just want to, want to throw up. Um, there was uh, a time that Rebecca and I uh, used to love to go out uh, for oysters. See, I told you I was going to talk about oysters. Uh, and, and it was part of like, our, like a date night experience for us. We like to go get oysters. Uh, and then one time, I got really sick. Uh, so I, I, I threw up a lot that night. And so now, if I'm in a, a restaurant at all, and I can smell an oyster, I have the feeling like I want to throw up. It's like, it totally ruined, oy it's really sad. I don't know if there are any oyster fans out, out there? No. Yeah. So, uh, so don't throw up, because it'll, it'll, it'll all be gone. Uh, that, that feeling that you get sometimes, that you want to throw something up, is the feeling that Jesus has for our, our last church, uh, the church of Laodicea. Uh, Jesus literally is so disgusted with this church, uh, he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. Uh, and so that's, that's the feeling that he has for this, for this church. And, and so you know the saying, uh, save the best for last. Uh, that's why I always save whatever I'm eating that's really good, the last bite for Rebecca, cause I, cause, because I love her. But the, I told her last night, because I, I did it, and I said, I always love when you don't want it. <laughs> but I, but I, still off, I still offer it every time. Uh, but we saved the best for last. In this case, though, in the case of these seven churches we've been looking at, um, we've saved the worst for last. This is the worst church um, of the seven. But the message that we're going to get from this church, um, I would argue, is the best message um, of all the seven. Uh, because it's a message of amazing grace. It's amazing of unconditional love. It's, amaz it's a message of relationship uh, that Jesus wants to have with you. That no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or what you're currently doing or, or how off course you might be, uh, Jesus wants a relationship with you. So for the worst church, we have, I think, the, the best message, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that today. But you can see we've traveled all around Asia Minor. Uh, we started with Ephesus, and now we're in uh, Laodicea um, at the end here. And it's in the, in the Lycus Valley. Uh, they call it the Tri-Cities. There's three little cities there uh, that, we'll, that we'll look at here in a second, too. Um, so if, if you're here today, and, and you know, life can sometimes be off course, or, or you know you're not perfect, but you want to continue to improve your relationship with Jesus, then the message that was given to this church thousands of years ago is a message for us today. It's a message for us to remember uh, that, that what Jesus wants from us is a relationship. Uh, he wants to be let into our lives and, and, and to spend time with us uh, and, and to be with us, no, no matter who, because he, he already knows you, right? He already knows who you are. You're not hiding anything uh, from Jesus. Um, here's the city now. Somebody last week asked me, uh, are, are these cities still there, right? Are they, like, where are they now? So here's Laodicea today. Uh, you can go there and, and walk around the, the ruins. It's amazing the, how some of the, the structures are still standing and the pillars are still standing. You know, it's not a bustling city. Uh, but there's a couple things about this city uh, that, that we need to know some background to understand the message that's given to them um, for that, that we're about to read. The first thing is this, the, the, the city was very, was very wealthy. Uh, the church and the city as a whole had a lot of means, they had a lot of resources, they had a lot of money. They were very comfortable. They actually had to spend $850 a month to live there, right? <laughs> very much similar, to, I'm kidding. Uh, like, like here, Las Palmas. 
uh, but they, they had a lot of they had a lot of wealth, and that wealth came from a different a couple different areas. Um, they had a medical school there, and a wellness spa. Uh, so you could go there. It's like a, if you went to a day spa today, you could go there and, and heal and relax. Uh, they had a, an eye cream that they created that they would export out. Uh, and made a lot of money with that. And then they had textiles. They had sheep of different colors, and they were able to, to make material to, to sell as well. So even thousands of years ago, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and, 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 uh, and, and clothing were all big money makers, right? So, so some things just never have changed. Uh, so it's a very wealthy city, and, and, the, and the wealth that they have um, led to a lot of self-sufficiency and pride. So even for the church that's there, they're, they're, just, they're, they're part of this culture um, of self-sufficiency and, and pridefulness because of, of the means that they, that they have. Um, there's, a, there's actually an a, a earthquake that happened, and it destroyed some of the city. Uh, and instead of getting help from the capital of Rome to repair, they, they used their own resources and money to repair it. That's how self-sufficient the, the, the city and church was. So it's important to know that they were, they were very wealthy. The second thing that's really important to know about the city is that they had really bad water. Uh, their water was really, was really gross. Uh, they had no natural water source. So they created these pipes. You can see a picture of uh, the actual aqueduct that they created. Uh, and and they, they took water from a hot spring that was five miles away from town. So think about the engineering. Uh, that went into that thousands of years ago. Uh, they took water from a hot spring five miles away. So by the time it got to the city, it wasn't hot anymore. It was, it was lukewarm. Uh, and it was full of minerals, not only minerals from the hot spring, but the minerals would collect in the piping. Uh, and it would get to the city, uh, and it was gross. right? So there's, we have ancient uh, documents and, and historians that talk about how bad the water in Laodicea was, because it was full of minerals, it wasn't warm or cold, uh, it, was, it was pretty gross, it was, it was pretty useless. And what's interesting is you could look, um, if you were in Laodicea and you looked one way in the Tri-City area, uh, you could see Hierapolis, uh, and Hierapolis had hot springs. So this is a picture here of the hot springs in Hierapolis, uh, and you can go there today. That white isn't snow, it's calcium. It's full of minerals, uh, and those, those hot springs are really good to, to sit in and, uh, and heal. There was medicinal purposes for the hot water over in, in Hierapolis. Or you could look the other way to Colossae, which is built on a mountain range by a mountain, and they would get the water drift coming down uh, from Cadmus, which was a big mountain, and that cold mountain water would come into the, that city, uh, and they would enjoy cold, refreshing water. So if you're in the city of Laodicea and you look one way, there's hot water and spring water that's good and useful. If you look the other way, there's cold, refreshing water that's good and useful. Uh, but your water is gross, <laughs> right? Your water is gross and useless. And, and these two things, of them being wealthy and self-sufficient uh, and then having water that's lukewarm and gross are really important for, for understanding the message uh, that we're about to read. So follow along as I read the, the message to the church in, in Laodicea. It says, it says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, uh, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline." So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
This is Revelation 3, the final church of our, of our series. And as we know, each of these churches starts with a title, a title of Jesus, that he wants the, the reader to, to hear and understand, that he wants the church to know about him that's intimate. And the title that he gives the, the church is this, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And so the emphasis here that he wants this church to hear and he wants us to know about him is, is, is again a re- re- repetition that he's God, that he's ultimately God and that his message is, is true. That what he's about to tell them, which is going to be harsh and hard because they're not doing well, is a true message that they need to hear uh, and take in to their hearts and really understand and make, and make some changes. It's also a message of his preeminence. He's first. And he needs to be first in their life. See, for the, for the church in Laodicea, what's first is their own means and their resources. And they're leaning on what they have to give them comfort. Uh, and that's led to pride and self-sufficiency. And what he wants them to know is that he's first. And he needs to be put first in their life. And he needs to put, be put first in, in our lives as well. Uh, they have a lot of, of means and resources and 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 it's okay to have that, but what you prioritize in life is really important. And Jesus wants to remind them that he's he's first and needs to be first in their life too. And that the message of each of these churches then has a commendation that's that's second, a a compliment that they get of something they're doing well. For the church here, there's no condemnation, no no commendation. There's no there's no compliment. They're not doing anything well worth mentioning. Again, they're the, they're the worst church. There's been two churches with no compliments and two churches with no complaints. This is the second church with no compliment, uh, and, it, and there's no redeeming qualities. The other church we looked at with no compliment, Jesus said, well, at least some of you haven't, haven't soiled your clothes. They haven't fallen into immorality. Uh, but in this church's case, there's, there's nothing. He's, he just, they're in a position that's poor and sad. Uh, and and it's, he wants to, again, spit them out of, out of his mouth. It's a reality check. Last week we talked about this being a reality check for this church. He, what he needs them to hear and understand that they need to make some changes. Uh, and, and the message isn't, isn't one that he's going to give them a lot of encouragement or coddling. He needs them to hear something very clear. And then we move into the complaint. He says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you either be cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So what's he saying? He's saying you're not useful. You're, you're like your water source, right? Sometimes we think of, we read that and we think lukewarm means like wishy-washy. Uh, but what he's, what he's referring to is their water supply. He's saying if you were in Hierapolis and you had the hot water, that's useful, that's good. If you're in Colossae and you had the cold water, that's useful and good. Your water is gross. <laughs> your water is not useful. And immediately they would have understood that Jesus is saying, you're like your water. You're like your water source. Uh, and I just want to vomit you out of my mouth when, I, when, I, you know, when you try to drink your water. That's what, that's what he's talking about. And then he goes on to say, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, <laughs> poor, blind, and naked. Uh, those are pretty harsh words. Uh, he's saying that you, you have a lot, and, and you know you have a lot, and you're leaning on your own sufficiency, but, but you, you're not seeing the reality of the issue. You're not seeing the reality of the problem. They think they're rich and prosperous, but in fact that they're, they're poor, blind, and, and naked. And he's relating these things to the things that they that they create and make in their own city. He's saying, you, you know, you, you make clothing and textiles, but, but in reality, you're naked. You make eye cream and salve to help people with their vision, but, but in reality, you're blind. You're not, you're not seeing your own issues. And so I need to step in and let you know, here, here's the problem that you need to see and address. And that's, that's pretty typical for, for a lot of us, I think for all of us, scripture's a mirror and as we read it, we're supposed to see ourselves and say, what, how do I become more Christ-like? What do I need to do to change and, and continue to grow and move in my life? A lot of times we use the Bible as a pair of binoculars, right? To look out and, and tell other people what they might be doing right or wrong. 
Uh, but we're supposed to be a mirror to see ourselves. But they don't see the reality of what's, of what's happening. Now, as, a, as an aside, just to say, to, to build wealth isn't bad. Actually, if you read the book of Proverbs, uh, there's wisdom in how to live life and how to, how to, how to build wealth. If you, if you give first, save second, and live on the rest, it's biblical basic principles, you can build, you can build wealth. Uh, the problem is that they are relying on what they've built and not on God first. There's a, there's a, there's a problem when we, when, we, when we have so much, we forget about how much we need to rely on God, that he's the source of everything we have. And for them, they've, they've forgotten that. Um, this is why Jesus, when you look at, the, uh, when you look at the, the Sermon on the Mount in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus knows the principles of Proverbs and how if you live a certain way, you can build wealth. But what he was emphasizing in the Lord's Prayer when he says, give us today our daily bread or our bread for today, he's emphasizing the, the remembering, the reliance that we have on God every single day. Right? There's a, there's, a, there's a training that happens in our minds if we pray the Lord's Prayer every day and we remind ourselves every day that today what I have and what I get comes from God. And God's got to be the one that supplies for me what I am and, and what I have each, each and every day of my life. No matter how much I have or how little I have. See, when you don't have a lot, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to rely on God for everything you have. You, you trust him more. You really focus on what he's supplying for you. And this prayer uh, is, is, a, is a deep prayer. Give me today what I need because I, I don't have the means to get it myself. When you have a lot, sometimes we lose that focus and we just look at our own means and say, I have a lot, I can, I can do it myself. And that's easy to fall into when you, when you have a lot of means. But when you, when you focus and you pray the Lord's Prayer every day and you think, God, give me today my daily bread, then the focus is always going to be, I know that no matter what I have today, you're the source of what I have. And I need to remember that every day of my life, no matter how little or how much the, the trick of life is to always remember that God is, is first and that he is the, the giver of everything that I have. Every day I have everything I have and not get caught up to where the church is, this church is, and, and, and be prideful and self-sufficient and forget that God's ultimately the one that gives you what you have every day. So it's important for us to, to train our minds as we think about these things and pray the Lord's Prayer daily to, to remind ourselves that. So, so he gives them some advice. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and, and repent. So he's telling them, hey, you know, you have all, this, all these things, but what I want you to do is, is, is buy these things from me, right? Buy from me first gold, uh, gold that will give you uh, real wealth, gold refined by fire. And that's always a, a statement of, of change and adversity and, and the things that, that how you become more Christ-like in life when you, when you go through struggles and hard times. This, this church and this city is very comfortable. They're not going through the difficulties of life that are, that are going to challenge them and help them to change and become more like, like him. And so he's saying what you need is, is for me to give you something that's going to help you change. Real, real gold, something that really matters in life, something refined by fire. And he says, I'm gonna, I need you to buy from me clothes, not your clothes that you're making, but my clothes that you can put on to be pure and hide the, the shame of your nakedness. And then in my eye salve, not the one that you make, so that you can actually see the reality of, of who you are in life. And, and what he's doing is he's, he's showing them at each, each of the places that he said, hey, you're poor, so you need my gold. You're blind, so you need my eye cream. You're naked, so you need my clothes. See, they, 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 don't, they don't see these things in themselves. And so Jesus has to remind them, that this is who you are. And, and how you fix these things is, is, is to come to me and to rely on me to help, to help move you in life and to be reliant on, 
on who I am. They need to look at Jesus. They need to cast away their own dependence and their desire to be like the culture and to just fit into the world. And, and they need to be different. They need to stand out as the church as, as, we, do, as we do today. And so in each of these letters or each of these messages, what happens is Jesus you know, gives a compliment, not here, but typically a compliment, and then a correction. Here's what you got to do differently and how. And then there's some kind of, uh, like, here's what's going to happen if you don't change. Here's what will happen if you do change. And we've seen some pretty hard corrections in, in the past letters. Like, if you remember in Ephesus, he goes, if you don't change, I'll just remove you as a church. That's pretty harsh, right? So there's, there's some harsh messages here. So when you get to, to this one, the worst church of the bunch, uh, and with, with no compliment, no redeeming value, they're, they're, they're blind, they're pitiable, they're poor, they're wretched. You're expecting something like, what is he going to do? <laughs> like, what is the, what's the consequence going to be if they don't make changes? Uh, and what he says is this. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne as I have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So for this church, that's the worst church. The, the correction is Jesus saying, I want to remind you that I'm, I'm just here knocking on the door. It's not... I'm going to come after you in judgment. I'm going to come remove your church. It's I'm just, I'm waiting for you to open the door. <laughs> I'm just knocking and waiting for you to let me in. So it's really a message of, of this amazing grace that he is, he's delivering to them. And he's saying, even though you've got some serious issues, actually, I, I have nothing good to say to you. I'm just waiting for you to, to open and let me in. That's a message for, for all of us to hear. And he says, if you let me in, I'll, I'll eat with you. In this, in this culture and time, there was three meals, kind of like what we have today. There was a, a kind of an informal breakfast. They would have a picnic lunch, and then they would have a, a really intimate, long uh, dinner. Uh, and that's what he's talking about here. I want to spend real intimate time, time with you. If you let me in, I'll, I'll spend time with you. I'll build relationship with you. We'll, 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 we'll get to know each other better, and you'll get to know me better. In today's world, where we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of you from some parts of the country call it breakfast, dinner, and supper. You've you got to stop doing that. <laughs> right? uh, it's confusing. So it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or supper. Either one for the last one. Okay. Uh, so this painting is called the Light of the World painting. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, by William Holman Hunt, uh, and it's, it's a very famous painting of Jesus knocking on the door. And what you'll notice on the painting is there's no doorknob on his side of the door uh, to open the door from his side. What he's waiting for is the, the people inside to, to let him in. And that's, what, that's his message, that's his correction to, to the, this church, is I'm just waiting for you to let me in. I'm just waiting for you to let me in. And if you let me in, we can have a relationship. That's his message for us, us today, that he wants a relationship with us. And he's knocking on the door, and he wants to, to spend time with you. So if you're here, and you can kind of relate maybe to this church in, in your life, or in one area of your life, or at times of your life, and you want to grow in your relationship with Christ, there's three things in your bulletin uh, to, to notice, lessons for this, from this church. And the first one is this, open the door. Open the door. Jesus is literally knocking on your door, the knocking on the door of your life. And no matter what you've done in life, no matter where you've been in life, no matter what's been done to you, no matter where you even are, are today, or how blind you might be or how off course you are, Jesus is just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just knocking and I'm waiting. And I want you to open the door and let me in. But the problem is, He's going to keep knocking until you let him in. And the reason why we don't let him in all the time is because letting Jesus in means, means something's going to change, right? Something's going to be different. 
I've got to change from being self-reliant to relying on him. I've got to change maybe a behavior or, or something. I've got to do something different. Letting him in and opening the door is going, to mean, is going to mean change in my life. And so he's just sitting there waiting for us to, for us to let him in. So we've got to open the door. That's, that's step one. If you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, open the door. <laughs> let, it, let him into your life. Let him into the areas of your life uh, that, that he knows of, that you may not share or, or other people might know as, as well, but he's, he's there waiting for you to, to let him in. The second thing to do is to enjoy quality time with Jesus. What he's saying to them is, if, if you let me in, we'll, we'll eat together. We'll enjoy the, the, the most intimate, longest time of the day together. We'll get to know each other and and as you get to know Jesus more, you'll build more relationship, and that, will, and that will change you. Jesus already knows who you are. He knows the real you. And what's awesome about Jesus knowing the real you and the real me is that he loves the real you, and he loves the real me. He loves who you are now, no matter how messed up that is. And he loves this church, even how off course they were. And he's just, again, standing there waiting, knocking, wanting them to let him in so that he can have a relationship with them, a real relationship, not just coming to church, not just maybe doing some things that look like a Christian, um, but, but having life change. And the third thing is like, let his presence change you. Let his presence change you. If you let him in and you spend time with him, you'll, you'll change, you'll grow. You'll, 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 you'll see things differently. You'll, you'll experience the world deeper. You'll let go of the things that were holding you back. You'll, you'll see the things that you have maybe in your means as, as something lesser than they were, and you'll, and you'll realize that it's Jesus is the source of everything, and, he, and he's always been. It's not laws. It's not rules. It's not do's and don'ts that will change who you are. It's, it's just a relationship with Jesus that will change who you are. His relationship with you, and the closer you are to him, the more the more, you'll, the more you will change. The more, the more you'll change. The more like him you'll be when you spend more time with him. And that's what he's asking us all to do. For, so for the worst church of the seven and the final church, we've got the best message because the message is about amazing grace. It's, it's this is how bad you are. Here's the reality of the situation. Um, but I'm just waiting for you to open the door knocking, waiting. What areas in our life do we need to open the door to Jesus? It's never too late, and we're never too off course. We're never too blind for Jesus. He's going to keep, he's going to keep knocking, and he just wants us to let him in. And when we do, we're going to see change in our life. We're going to spend quality time with him, and we'll, and we'll grow. Next week, we're starting a, a new series, if you see the back of your bulletin, called Grace in Action, a study and practice of spiritual disciplines. And so when you, when you think about this idea of, of how do I spend time with Jesus, how do I let him in to my, to my door, and how do I grow, what we'll be talking about over the next few weeks is the practices of being a Christian. What do I do daily to to spend time with Jesus and then letting that time with Jesus grow me and change me uh, to, to who he wants me to be. No longer being so self-sufficient maybe on what I have, but more relying on him. Whatever it is in our lives that are holding us back or keeping us away, how do I grow closer to him? And in that, how do I, how do I change? Let me, let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your, your word and the messages that you give us. Your word is alive and active and it will, it will, it will change who we are. So I, I pray today, Lord, that as, as we hear your message to the church in Laodicea and we hear you knocking at our lives, I just pray that all of us will let you in. In whatever areas that is for us in our lives, and ever, and, and, and whatever we need to, to change or, or do, I, I pray that we'll let you in. I thank you that what you want f from us is, is it just a relationship. To spend time with us and as we spend time with you, We'll, we'll change and become more like you. So I pray as we even end uh, this series and move into the next that we'll, we'll learn the habits and disciplines that will, that will change us even more. 
that will grow our relationship more intimately and help us to be more like you in life. In Jesus' name, amen.